Hey guys, you're listening to Tax Tuesday. This is Toby and Jeff. Yeah, there you go. Um, hey, welcome to Tax Tuesday. There's a bunch of people out there. Hope we're coming through loud and clear. If you can't hear us, let us know and uh, we'll speak up. The uh, fun stuff with Tax Tuesday. First off, uh, happy Tuesday, Jeff. I don't Thank want to you. Miss. Uh, but let's just go over the rules. When you ask live questions, we will answer them uh, before the end of the webinar. Uh, some people said, hey, I'm going to be in Vegas tomorrow. Cool. You should, you should uh, hit us up when you're in town. Uh, send your questions to tax Tuesday at AndersonAdvisors.com. We will put you into a queue of the questions that we pull into these. And also, we'll make sure that you get a question, uh, your question answered. If you need a very detailed response, in other words, you're asking stuff like, hey, um, you know, this is very specific to you and it's actually tax advice on yours. Then we're going to say, hey, become a platinum or tax, tax client because uh, it's going to be more than just a, a simple little answer uh, on the actual rules. Uh, this is fast, fun and educational. We want to get back and help educate. If you guys haven't gone to uh, this is your first tax Tuesday. Hopefully you're in for a treat. If you've been through these, you know that half the fun is listening to what everybody else asks. I, I have so many people that walk up and they're like, wow, I can actually answer questions now. Just as soon as I hear something, I have a way of. Uh, uh, let's see. Somebody says, oh, here we go. Definitely. And definitely one hour. Hey, no, we don't uh, usually hit the one hour. Let me see if I can move my it just does not want to drag. There we go. You guys ask really long questions and it eats up my whole screen sometimes. So we'll get it. Uh, la, 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 la. Let's jump into the questions that we're going to be answering today. There's already a couple questions that are out there. Let's just do one that uh, they said from last year. Uh, did you guys answer the question last week? Don't see it in the recording. Do distributions from state specific disregarded LLCs to a Wyoming holding cause a taxable event? It's not the distribution uh, that actually causes the taxable event. I'm assuming that you're talking about LLCs that are owning real estate in uh, in local areas. Um, you're going to end up paying tax on it. Uh, hold on just for a second. This is great. Um, you're going to end up paying tax on it because it's sourced from a different state. So you're going to pay the state tax on it. Right. Yeah. So that's that's all that's going to happen. So no matter what. Uh, if you make, for example, I'm trying to think of a state that has a tax that would, that I always think of Tennessee and they don't have, <laughs> I don't know why I always go to Tennessee. Well, let's go a little bit north if you're in Kentucky and you have a distribution uh, from your LLC. Does it even matter if there's a distribution? Because you're going to be paying the state tax regardless, right? Right. So, yeah, I said distribution. I said exactly what the uh, uh, questioner said. Yeah, you, you're going to pay it. <laughs> So, so if, yeah, if you make $100,000 in that entity, pass-through entity, whether you take that money out or not, you're going to pay tax on it. Yep. It always passes through. Unless it's an LLC going to a holding LLC, that is a corporation. Um, and then somebody says, do you need a tax license besides an EIN for rental property? Uh, not necessarily. Some states you're going to have to register with the city mm -hmm. as a landlord. Uh, use a good property manager and they'll let you know. But the entity itself, other than if, if it's in the state, then you're easy. If you're out of the state, then technically it needs to register to do business in the state if it's going to hold the property. Or you use a land trust and have the land trust take its beneficial interest. And uh, uh, we're going to take that beneficial interest and we're going to uh, assign that out to a different LLC. Somebody says, hey, I don't see the questions you're talking about. It's because I'm reading them out of the uh, the screen. <laughs> the, there's constant questions. So if you guys haven't been on these before, just know that we go through regular questions, which I'm about to go with that. Um, boom. So we're going to start going through all the opening questions. But if you guys ask really good questions, I just answer them. So I'll read them from it, but you're not going to see it because it's in a chat feature and I'm not going to show your guys' information and your name. So I just don't make that visible. Uh, so I'm sorry, but sometimes you'll see me on a slide for quite a while. The guys that are on the podcast, you don't have to care because you not you don't see it. But when you're doing the, uh, the webinar format, you can see the actual screen and you're going to say, oh man, um, uh, here we go. 
What do you have to file when you have an S corporation take a salary? We'll go over that. I'm a small business owner who last year didn't make any income. Do I have to file? We'll go over all that. How much of my remodel can I claim on my taxes as expenses versus improvements? Hint, when you say remodel, <laughs> yeah. I know. I think Jeff and I had the same comment on that. Uh, when rolling over traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, is this then counted as regular income in the year the rollover? How does it impact Social Security payments? And so uh, we'll go over that. That's an interesting one. Uh, I'm 74 years old and have had my Roth IRA since December 10th, 2009. I usually do a conversion of my rollover IRA established in 2002 to my Roth IRA each year. I thought earnings on the Roth IRA are were tax free, but I understand the government implemented new rules, the trio of five year rules. Actually, they've always been there. Uh, can you explain how this affects me and what is my plan of action? We'll go over that. Can you claim both the home office deduction and the section 280A for the same C Corp? Uh, how do you report real estate rental income for properties in a trust? So those are good questions today. Yes, they are. Um, but they keep keep going on, Jeff. Like there's people blasting us with questions online, and then we have all these questions too. And I wanted to be done in an hour. We'll talk fast. All right. My question is, I don't think we've ever been done in an hour. My question is, I have someone uh, who us. Uh, that's his title. He's based abroad and he is willing to provide funds for gap funding and house flipping. How do I go about it? Uh, good question. My husband and I filed separately, but my husband didn't have any income in 2019 and I did. Can I claim him as a dependent on my return with the married filing separately status? Uh, interesting question. What determines your state residency when you live in a non fixed location like an RV or a boat? Uh, Interesting. I am starting an LLC. What is the best entity to lend it money for a startup? Another very, these are intriguing questions. Tax liability as a dual citizen in Canada, USA, and recently received an inheritance from my Canadian parents. Oof. Is a SDIRA, that's a self-directed IRA, subject to UDFI, unrelated debt financed income when invested in a syndication that uses debt financing? If so, what's the alternative? Um, will UBIT, so that's unrelated business income tax, or UDIF, unrelated uh, debt income, what is it? Financing. Uh, yeah, financing occurred in my SIDRA, self-directed IRA. I'm investing passively in syndication where there is a non-recourse. Is UDIF it's the same thing as UDFI? Or are we looking at different things? No, they're they're the same, same. thing. Yeah, I always thought I was called UDFI. Maybe I'm backwards. Um, here's an interesting one. This one kind of caught my mind, caught my eye. Uh, I lost my property to foreclosure. My CPA treated it as investment property since it was rental property before I lived in it. However, I lived in that property for two years of the last five years. Was my CPA correct or should I amend that tax year return? Really weird question, right? There's so many issues there. Right. So my question today is, if I have a Roth IRA, do I have to pay capital gains tax on monies that the Roth produces, or is that growth tax deferred? Uh, somebody says, I transitioned to real estate professional this year, looking at how to write off expenses uh, on my husband's W-2 income. So uh, assuming you guys are filing jointly, we'll go over that. And then last question, I have a family limited partnership that's going to get a large sum of money. I plan to put it all into a nonprofit, any taxes out. So, uh, we'll good, go. qu good question, but we'll talk. <laughs> yeah, good question. <laughs> I love this. Let's see. There's a whole bunch of questions that came in, by the way. Um, let's see. So, gosh, there's a lot of them. Here we go. Somebody paid some tuition for, looks like, seminars. So, uh, so they went through some classes and they want to be able to. to deduct uh, tuition on those classes. Here's the issue. Uh, if you don't have a business, it's going to be when you are actually in business. So for a lot of people, uh, and I'm just going to say, I'm just going to make a black screen. I shouldn't even do this. Everybody always starts yelling at me saying, hey, where's the question? Well, I'm answering. I'm, I'm reading it online. Um, so William, you're going to want to make sure that you actually have a company set up and that it's reimbursing you or using this as a startup expense. As an individual, unless you are already in that activity, it's going to be really hard to deduct 
education expense. It's really easy to deduct edu- edu- education expense as a startup if it's shown that you're it's in the investigation of creating the business. But a lot of folks, they kind of do it backwards. And uh, there's actually a, a case that involves somebody that actually went to a class and his accountant uh, convinced them to do the opposite of what we were recommending. And he ended up being a tax court case and lost. And we always looked at that going, wow, we were right. That really stinks because we would have rather been long for the wrong for the guy because he got hit with a pretty big tax. But he hadn't, you know, it really came down to when did he get into real estate? And in that particular case, he didn't buy a property until December and he had done the classes prior. You can't write those off. And then if you are a stock market person, you can never write them off uh, as an investor. So you always have to use an entity. In California, if I lend to a flipper with a shared appreciation note, does that borrower need to issue me a K-1? So Flavius, no. Uh, if it's a shared appreciation, it means it's a loan with a contingent interest, and that is interest. Uh, so they're going to give you a 1099 INT. Um, anyway, we got to jump. You like this stuff, right? Yeah. So, so I'm here every other Tuesday. Interrupt me if I ever start blabbling on too long. That would be right now. <laughs> Um, hey, guys, I'm not going to go over this very long. You know that we have classes out there. If you like Tax Tuesday, but by all means, we will invite you to come to a tax and asset protection workshop class or an infinity investing workshop class. Uh, reach out to us, Tax Tuesday at Anderson Advisors. Let us know if you're interested in classes, and we'll have somebody reach out to you and give you your options. Uh, for the most part, the level one classes, we will comp you in if you're part of Tax Tuesday. So uh, the tax and asset protection workshop, there are three-day workshops. They're all over the country. And Infinity Investing Workshop, those are one-day workshops now. We're going to start having them, I think, April 18th is the next class, Saturday all day. But it's a uh, class that is live streamed, so you don't have to leave your house. All right, let's jump into the questions. What do you have to follow when you have an S corporation and take a salary? Jeff. Well, there's all kinds of, of forms that you have to file, payroll tax forms. Uh, you may have to register with a state for withholding if you're in a taxable state. You may have to register with a city or county if you're like in Kentucky or Ohio. Um, so what I strongly recommend, it's not exact, exactly cheap, but can save you a lot of trouble, is that you, you sign up with a payroll company. Payroll companies, just say this, they may cost you like 50 bucks a month or something mm-hmm. like that if you're doing consistent payrolls. Or you just go online and you do one, and it might cost you 100 bucks or 200 bucks for the year. But they do all the tax filings. Right. It's so much easier than trying to do it your, your, yourself. And somebody says, and it's worth it. Yeah, they, they can tell you if you need unemployment or not, workman's comp or not. Uh, mm-hmm. It's uh, This is one of those areas where you think you're, you have yourself covered and you don't. I'm going to give you guys something else, too. If you are somebody and you have between five and 20 employees or thereabouts, there's something else you should know that exists out there that's going to make life easier for you. It's called a PEO. I'm just going to write it up there so you can always look at it. Um, I am going to write PEO, and that's a professional employee organization. For those of you guys in California, for example, this is a big one because if you had contractors, in your business, there's a good chance AB5 just made them into employees. So it's so much easier not to deal with the nonsense. No more 1099, that's correct. Um, What you wanna do is instead of you becoming an HR and developing your own, if you're between five and 20 employees, it's not gonna be worth it. Use an outside company. And the reason that it's it's better for you, because you'll end up paying about the identical as if you did it yourself, because they will save you money because of their rating for things like workman's comp and unemployment because they own, they have all the employees and they get benefits, pooled benefits. So they get a master group plan. I wish you could do this as, as one person. You can't, I think most of them, it's the, the minimum is three. It could be three bam, family members. So it'd be a husband and wife and a, and, a, and a child or another friend or parent or whatever, brother, sister, you name it. And uh, then you get access to things that only, group plans that only groups get available to. Um, so PEO is something that you should look at. If you are a small mom and pop, one person, two person, husband and wife, then you might want to go ahead and just use a payroll company. There's some easy ones, uh, ADP out there and paychecks and there's ton online, Patriot. 
And some of these companies, if you're taking payroll and you want to set up a retirement plan, you can actually work with a payroll company to to help you with that out too. And mm-hmm. um, so you're so you're not messing up that those plan requirements. Yep. And you know, he, he, here's another like there's some great questions coming in here. So he, he, that nobody can see. Yep. Nobody can see. <laughs> Would it make sense as a one one self employed person to pay yourself a salary? This is where it gets really interesting. And it depends on how much you're making because you have to look at it. There's two calculations that we have to do now. First off, if you're self-employed and an individual, you're going on a Schedule C. You will be paying Social Security. uh, They call it self-employment tax, but it's Mm -hmm. old age, death and survivors and uh, Medicaid on uh, up to $137,000 on every dollar. And it's when you add those things up, it's actually 15.3%, but you get a small deduction for half of it. So you end up, it's 14.1% is the easiest way to look at it. If you set yourself up as an S-corp, you avoid that on about two thirds of that money. So right. it ends up saving you about $10,000 a year on that scenario. It, but on the, you know, on the flip side, if you're at 30,000, it may not make much of a difference at all and you're using a corporation. <laughs> um, so it always, the, the answer to all tax questions is always, calculate, 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 get your pencil out and determine whether it makes sense from a tax standpoint, but don't forget about asset protection. Don't forget about estate planning and business planning. Make sure that everything kind of all falls in line and works. And, uh, you know, there's other fun stuff like an S corp gets audited 0.02% of the time versus a, a moderate, you know, a hundred thousand dollars sole proprietors at 2.4 sole proprietors lose, 94% of the time S corps lose about 60% of the time. So like when you're looking at it, it's like, Hey, uh, S corp starts looking better and better and better. Right. That's why we like them. All right. So that's the answer to that question. There's a few others. Um, it's not specifically required by a state is a reason to notify the secretary of state that an LLC has sold their interest to another party. So, so Tom, well, yeah, yeah. So if somebody sells an entity, it, it's the same thing as if you sold the underlying asset. So if you if it's real estate and you change more than 50 percent ownership, almost always you're going to have to report that to the county as though you sold the underlying real estate. Um, there's questions all over the place. Greetings from Alaska. Greetings. I'm going to be up there. Um, I think next week. Uh, here's another one. I think we've got two two questions now. I know I see them. They're, they're no, you you need to go back one. Oh, did I did I bust ahead? I'm a small oh I'm a small business owner who last year didn't make any income. Do I have to file, Jeff? Well, it depends on what kind of small business owner you are. If you're a uh, corporation or an S corporation, yes, you have to file. Uh, if you're a partnership and had no income or expenses. You don't necessarily have to file, especially if it's your initial year, uh, but I kind of recommend it. Um, if you have losses, I, I know you said you didn't make any income, but if you have losses, I absolutely file that uh, because that can lo- lower your income if you have other income. You just nailed it. I don't know what else to say. Okay. Uh, Next question. <laughs> yeah. You know, so it gets kind of weird. As an individual, technically, we don't have to file if we don't make any money. But most businesses, you don't have that exception. So if you have an S-corp, so if you're filing an 1120S or a partnership 1065, if you don't file, if you don't make any money, you have some pretty heinous penalties. What is it, 195 a month now? If you don't. Uh, it's file, 205, I believe. 205. Now. Jeez, they keep raising it. So it could be really ugly. Um, so make sure that I would always tell people, just make sure you file your taxes on time. And by on time, that doesn't mean April 15th for individuals and, you know, whatever it is for, you know, for a lot of S corps, it's March 15th. It means add in the absolute positive guaranteed uh, extension. So we're really talking about filing your taxes by September and October. Pay your taxes if you owe any, but if you don't owe any, still do the return. Mm -hmm. As Jeff said, there might be some tax reasons why we want to do it because we can capture some losses even if we're just carrying them forward. Uh, if you're sole proprietor, by the way, take that loss and offset your other active yeah. income. Even if you're not required to file, you may yeah. be able to carry that loss over the next year. Yep. Well, if you're sole proprietor, you're taking that 
Oh yeah, if if you as an individual, you could still just keep carrying that forward. Um, how much of my remodel can I claim on my taxes as expenses? <clears throat> excuse me, versus improvements. Well, what we were talking about earlier uh, was what, what you call a remodel. You're almost saying that it's all improvements. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to kind of separate out what is an improvement from what is a repair. Mm -hmm. um, and, and one of the other things, well, well, I see this maybe the only time I can bring it up, but this may be a time for cost segregation if it's substantial. Yeah, so Jeff's hitting on something that's really important, and uh, actually a couple of things that are really important. Number one is when you do something on a property, it's going to fall in one of two categories. It's either a betterment to the property that's going to make it worth more, or it's fixing something that's already there. Uh, the repair is deductible. The betterment is depreciable. And the level of depreciation depends on whether or not you do, you've done a cost segregation or whether you're choosing the default um, mackers or the straight line depreciation in English. If I have a property and it's residential uh, property, like rental properties, it's going to be 27 and a half years. If I have a commercial property, it's 39 years, unless I do an engineering study and or cost segregation study and break off the pieces. It's really easy when you do a remodel because now you have the invoices directly, um, in which case you may have some of those things where you're writing them off over five years, seven years, 15 years. All of a sudden that remodel doesn't look so bad. You may not want to write them all off in one year. You may want to let them just offset your income for the next five or six years out of the top bracket. Um, but the other thing that's really important is there's a safe harbor for repairs of $2,500, which means if you do something for $2,500 in a property, you call it a repair period, whether it's a betterment or not, you're allowed to do that and the IRS can't audit it. Uh, so that's really good. Something we don't talk about a lot, and I, but I got the question the other day, is making improvements or remodeling my personal residence. Um, and actually we want the opposite to happen. You want those to be improvements. They're not deductible. You can't expense them anywhere, mm -hmm. uh, but it does increase your cost basis in that property. So the more improvements you have, the more your cost base is going to be. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, flippers. That's always the question we get. Like they're fighting like crazy to call something a repair and you're like, you're selling the house. Yeah. You're just going to add it to your basis anyway. Well, in the case, yeah. In the case of flipper, everything goes into your cost right. basis. Yeah. So it's like, eh, eh. All right. Um, somebody else asked, I purchased uh, a Wyoming LLC that is over two years old and I'm applying for an EIN. EIN has gotten so detailed, uh, the use of the LLC is being considered for several different functions. What is the best selection to make EIN simple? Easier for someone else to apply. Can I apply for it? Um, KC, it's just an EIN. Uh, depends on whether you want it to, that LLC to be taxed as disregarded as a corporation or as a partnership. Uh, that's all you're doing with your EIN. I think they might be thinking of something else, uh, the type of business, because uh, I, you know, I would just decide whether you want it to flow onto your return or be on somebody, you know, be somebody else's. Yeah, the form to get the EIN is fairly simple, um, and some of your answers aren't even binding. Like as far as what year end do you want, what type mm -hmm. of entity it is. Hey, Elijah just asked a good question. Can taxpayers who don't actively participate in real estate activities but own a rental still qualify for the rental real estate loss allowance? Um, there is no such thing. No. <laughs> what you do is uh, passive, passive losses offset passive gain with two exceptions, active participation or being a real estate professional. So if you are... If you have rental <laughs> property, that is per se passive unless you meet one of those exceptions. Now, do you think he might be talking about that $25,000 rule? That's active participation. So he says you don't actively participate. Oh, sorry. Never mind. So, I, so I'm just saying that the, the two exceptions are active participation or a real estate professional. Right. Um, but great question, Elijah. And that's how hard it is. Like with people always get uh, rental properties confused with capital gains and capital losses. A capital loss, you can use $3,000 a year and offset your active income. With rental losses, you can't use it at all. 
unless you dispose of the asset, in which case then you can take that all those losses that you didn't get to take before and take them all in one year. All right. I waited till 70 to receive Social Security and I'm getting a salary. Should I ask ADP to stop taking out Social Security? I don't think that's don't, a choice. Yeah, I don't think it's a choice. Olga. I think you still have to. It's, it stinks. Um, and they don't even put it aside. They just put it right in the general fund and then they spend it. Uh, somebody says, hey, to write off a class, do you have to have the corporation set up, the LLC already set up? No. What you want to do, what's the best situation is before you go to the class, make sure the business is set up. Because after you go to the class, well, then you, you have, you have some, uh, you're going to be amortizing a lot of it. Um, all right, let's jump on to more questions that are in the actual go, uh, the PowerPoint. All right. <laughs> I mean, I'm, I'm, you, there's so many questions coming in online, guys. Like, it's nuts. So uh, I will get to as many as I can here in a second. Um, so somebody just says, so is it right I can write off anything over $2,500? as an expense on your primary home? No, Jeff, you can't write off anything with your primary home. Right. You can only write off things that are income producing property. So it has to be a rental property. Your home, when you do stuff, you just add it to your basis. Yeah, you just want to keep track of all those expenses and improvements. Mm -hmm. and Yeah, the, the exception is if you're fixing up your house to sell it, then I think you can write it off right away, I think. I'm in the recesses of my head, it says, hey, if you fix up your house to sell it, you it's not even something you have to do on basis. I think you actually take it as a deduction. I'm not sure. Um, but for the most part, no, you can't do it on your personal house. Uh, I am a 74 years old. Congratulations. And I have had my Roth IRA since December 10th, 2009. I usually do a conversion of my rollover IRA established March 8th to my Roth each year. So what they're doing is they're taking a piece of it every year and they convert it. So maybe it's five, six, whatever, however many thousands of dollars a year. Maybe it's 10,000, maybe it's 20,000. Uh, I thought earnings on the Roth IRA are were tax free. They are, but I understand the government implemented new rules, the trio of five year rules. Well, so so your conversion is never the issue. It's the earnings once you convert. Right. So once you convert your traditional to your Roth, that's you're going to pay tax on that conversion. And then as long as you hold it for five years after the conversion and every year you, you're having a new conversion, you have to wait five years or the gains on that money will be have a penalty imposed. Is it a penalty or is it tax? Uh, it's a tax? It, it will be subject to the tax. Subject to tax. So you have five years from conversion five years from contribution and what's the other five years uh, on an inheritance inheritance. Right. So, and all it's saying is, Hey, you have to let it stew for a little while. So I think because you're doing all these conversions, like you're going to have a little bit of accounting to track, but, you, but if you pull it out, you're going to take it out of the money that's already met the conversion requirement. You're not going to take the whole thing out. Um, and so the way it would affect you is just be careful not to start pulling all the money out what you may want to do is if you're really looking at this conversion, A, is make sure it makes sense. Mm -hmm. A lot of times people that are converting their IRAs, it doesn't make any sense because their taxes are going to drop after. You know, like if you're converting because your income tax is really low and you're moving it over there and then you're going to start drawing out this money, then I say, you know, bless you, that's perfect. And just make sure that you're aware and you don't dip into the earnings of one of those conversions um, which would be really hard for you to do. Like I, I, if you're doing this all the time, my guess is you have some sizable amount. I wouldn't really be worried about it. Just, just mark it and say, Hey, just be careful. If we go above this dollar amount, there right. may be a, a tax. Um, and you could actually calculate it. Somebody asks, um, there's a whole bunch of questions online that have some fun stuff. So, uh, I'm just going to answer a couple of the questions online just because my screen's getting, rolled over. I saw an old YouTube video from Clint saying best to avoid real estate deals done by your Roth self-directed IRA. Once Anderson has set up my LLC for my Sidra and a new JV between me, between it and Roth holding used by my solo 401k to purchase and flip properties, both parties are JV coming from Roth accounts. So this is, this is going to drive me crazy. This is a long one. Uh, are there any taxes involved with the IRS give a flip a dealer status? Thanks in advance. All right. So what's going on here is you have two self-directed 
IRAs doing a joint venture together um, and they're going to flip a property. So technically there's no guidance on whether that's UBIT is what you'd really be looking at there. It's not, you know, so dealer status is you and me and we don't want to be a dealer. There's dealer status doesn't really get nailed onto an IRA. Right. It's going to be UBIT and there's no cases on it. So they always say, you know, the, the rule of thumb is anything less than six, I'm not going to worry about. That's just other people's. I'm just going to say that there's no guidance on it. But if you're buying a house, then technically they're kind of looking at it saying, hey, as long as you don't do it too often, we're not going to we're not going to yell at you. Um, if you have an S Corp and a SEP IRA, do you have to take out those distributions out of W-2 box one wages uh, on a SEP? You're making the contribution of 25 percent of the amount that you're taking. So I don't even think you can defer. It. The, yeah. The only thing you take out of the box one would be employee contributions, which yep. you normally wouldn't have on a SEP. Uh, and get a refund on the payroll taxes previously paid. Oh, do you get it? Do you get a? Do you actually you're still paying uh, self-employed? The You're still. Yeah. So if you did, um, it would only come out of box one. It wouldn't affect Social Security or Medicare. Mm hmm. Uh, so there would be no change. It would yeah. actually be the employee's money and they would get the recovery. Yeah. So uh, because I, it, it, what you're asking is in your situation, if you're doing the SEP, the S Corp's contributing 25 percent for the businesses, uh, which I'm usually going to go to a 401k anyway, because I do want to do what you're contemplating, which is the deferral, uh, which is much better, in my opinion. Uh, you do. You can do both, by the way. The, mm -hmm. uh, Solo 401k actually has the deferral and the the uh, 25 percent, whereas the SEP is just the 25 percent. Um, but you're not paying. You're not take, uh, paying the payroll taxes on that. Yeah, the, the employer contributions are never going to reduce the uh, your payroll taxes. Mm -hmm. uh, if you change ownership from a California LLC to a trust, then Wyoming LLC is a beneficiary. Can someone follow the chain? No, it's almost impossible. Um, are you following expenses deductible as we start up expenses? Are you following uh, or the following, I have no idea what, what that question is. Sorry. Um, are the following expenses deductible as startup expenses for a partnership? Let me see if you ask something else. I don't see it. It looks like somebody got caught midstream. Uh, does a trust instead of a corporation better for sole proprietorship in California, no, the, the trust doesn't give you any protection. Um, realistically, if you're going to set up a business, you want to have the you want to have the wall around you. You don't want to be subject to uh, having somebody take all your stuff because the business fails. Right. All right. Let's jump back into these ones where Jeff can actually see them. All right, <laughs> Jeff, can you claim both the home office deduction and the Section 280A for the same C Corp? I'm going to say no, but for technical reasons. Okay. Typically, if it's a home office deduction, we are only seeing that on a sole proprietor. Yep. Um, and a sole proprietor cannot claim Section 280A deduction. They're not going to have corporate expenses. Okay. And since I said it was a C corporation, what we actually <laughs> yeah. want the C corporation to do is not do a home office deduction. We want the C corporation to be reimbursing the homeowners for the, uh, for expenses the business use of the home for for that home office. You're such an accountant. But what's that mean in English, Toby? It means that you can reimburse yourself for the cost of the home office <laughs> and you can reimburse yourself for the corporate use of the house for your meetings. And yes, you could do it out of the same corporation. So Jeff's Jeff's cool. He, he and I both went to the same thing. When you say home office deduction, that's a phrase that you use with the sole proprietorship. When you say an, uh, a, a business use of the home reimbursement, that's something different. It's not reportable by the individual. It's not calculated for depreciation recapture. It's basically a bunch of free money out of the company. And if you haven't heard of these concepts, you need to go to a tax wise there. I'll just make it simple. You need to come to a tax and asset protection or come to a tax wise uh, because we go over those. And that's about those two together are probably a good $20,000 a year of, of money in your pocket that, that the company can reimburse uh, you cat in, in write-off. How do you report real estate rental income for properties in a trust? I don't know. Uh, actually, <laughs> it, it's going to really depend on what kind of trust it is. 
If it's an irrevocable trust, did I say that right? Yeah, if it's irrevocable and it files its own tax return. Right. If it's if it's a revocable trust like a grantor trust or a living trust or they go by about a hundred different names, uh, it's going to be taxable to the grantor, which is you. Uh, so, somebody has asked me whether did did we intentionally skip over when rolling over a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA? We went over that. We went over that. Yeah, Tim or Benny, you need to go back. We hit that one. Um, did you report rental real estate income for properties in a trust? So the answer is, or how do you report it? It depends on how that trust is taxed. If the trust is irrevocable and pays its own tax, it's reported on the 1041. If it's irrevocable and it passes it to the beneficiaries, it's going to go via K1 to those beneficiaries. And what is that going to go? Page two of a schedule E? Uh, yeah. yeah. Well, no, actually, page one on Schedule E. Page one, they're just going to go straight on the front. Right. And then if it's a grantor trust, which means a grantor trust is a fancy way of saying we ignore the trust, mm -hmm. then it's going on whoever the grantor was. So if it's you, it's going to go on your individual tax return. If it's another irrevocable trust that sets it up, then technically you'd be on that. So like these, sometimes these questions, we get we get cheeky with it because it's because there's so many different ways to answer it. Should I bring up intentionally defective? Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't even start. All right. Um, somebody says, uh, somebody are saying this is, uh, I'm going to answer a question that somebody just asked. So I'm going to go back to that. So I'm going to piss off some of you guys. Sorry. Um, with the new AB5, this is somebody in California. Are contractors or subcontractors work to be classified as employees? So the answer is no, um, because there's an exception for those folks. I believe that there's an exception for those folks. I'm 99.9%. Um, and you just have to be careful. They need to have their own licensing, I believe, and be true subs. So there is an exception. So I would take a look at it. Uh, Somebody says, I wanted to register as an S-Corp, however, because I'm a single member LLC, I'm being told I have to file as a sole proprietorship. Why? Because whoever is advising you, Derek, is incorrect. Uh, your LLC can choose however it wants to be taxed. If you want that LLC to be taxed as an S-Corp, you actually have your one document away, and you need to do it now. Mm -hmm. uh, you would file a 2553 before March 15th. And uh, it's a form 2553. It's all of two pages. You fill out a little bit of information, you sign it, and then magically your LLC will become an S Corp. And the IRS will confirm receipt of that and make sure it's, you know, so barring any uh, surprises, you're going to be treated as an S Corp. If, if whoever told you that just doesn't understand, uh, just doesn't understand them, yeah. Uh, Somebody else says, can I change my tax year for my LLC tax as a C Corp last August? Yeah, you can actually file your tax return within 12 months. Uh, yeah, for your initial return, you can make your year and whatever you want it to be within 12 months. Uh, after that, you have to get permission from the IRS, and that's on, on a form. It's, uh, I want to say, 1128. But yeah. anyway, you just request permission to change your fiscal year. So, Rick, it really comes down to it is if you just set it up, then you could just file your tax return. And if it's August, that means that you'd be due in what? 15 day of the third? Yeah, we would probably go, oh, what? if it's due in August, so it would be no, due. No, no, he, he his tax year is August. So the end of August, August 30th. <clears throat> so then he would, is it the fourth day of the, it's the 15th day of the fourth month or is it the third? Uh, so 15th day of the fourth month. So then after the year. So September, October, November, December. So December, December 15th. December 15th. So as long as you file it by December 15th of, this year, you'll be fine. Uh, I sold a rental property this year without an exchange. Can I chip away the capital gains taxes with write-offs that I may not be thinking of? Tina, you can actually do a qualified opportunity zone. And uh, potentially, as long as you set up a fund before, I think it's June 28th, you could defer the whole thing. And yeah, you could still chip away at capital gains. Uh, if you have any losses on capital losses, they'd automatically be used to offset. But uh, yeah, there's plenty of things. The other thing you do is, well, we will get into too many of them. Lots of questions going in. Here we go. Let's jump on to some more. Uh, my question is, I have someone who is based abroad 
And he, we actually take these questions directly as they come out. Sometimes we do a little bit of spell check on them, but sometimes not. Um, and he is willing to provide funds for gap funding in house flipping. How do I go about it? So first off, let me just set the table, Jeff, and then I'll ask you your opinion. A gap funder is somebody who's providing, he's a lender. They're a lender in a house, and if it's flipping, it means you're buying the house to sell it. So this is somebody who is, you know, so I don't know if they're foreign or if they just live abroad. And whether they're a, a U.S. citizen or whether they're a non-U.S. citizen, but let's just assume it's a non-U.S. citizen who's loaning money to you so you can flip houses. Yeah. Then how would you go about it? Jeff? Uh, getting money is very simple. Um, there's there's no forms to file. Uh, there's no returns to file just for getting the loan from the gap funder. Uh, I would suggest if you're getting money from offshore, mm. you're not giving them your banking information. <laughs> you don't want your account to disappear? Yeah. Uh, uh, let's assume this is somebody you know. Oh, okay, okay. So this is a re reputable gap funder. Um, so so everything's hunky dory. You you develop the house, you build the house, or reflip it. Uh, you're gonna have to get money back to that person to repay the loan and give him his share of the interest, or however you decided to divide up the income. Um, that income portion is gonna be subject to withholding. Uh, usually, it's a thirty percent rate depending on where they're at. Mm -hmm. Um, so if you give them back, if you've borrowed 50,000, you can give them back 60,000, that 10,000 that 10, is going to be subject to about $3,000 of withholding. And they're going to have to file what's called a 1040 NR, right? That's a 1040 non-resident for us based income. Uh, hopefully we have a treaty with the country. Yes. And the treaty may say, Hey, you don't have to do the same amount of withholding. Sometimes they go down to 15%. Sometimes they don't require any withholding at all. It just depends. So um, as far as the mechanics of it, though, just do a note and then we'll worry about the tax later. Like you want to make money and then worry about it. You want to go in knowing how it's going to be taxed. It's going to be taxed as interest, most likely in the United States. Right. And then if they pay U.S. tax, they'll get a credit and apply it towards their uh, foreign uh, tax, most likely. So that's the easiest way to look at it. If they're a U.S. citizen, then it's even easier. They should, they're just going to pay tax on that interest, even though they're 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 from a, abroad. If somebody says, "Hey, does the home office work with an LLC in reimbursement?" Um, yeah, as long as it's taxed as an S corp or a C corp, technically, even as a partnership, you could do it. And you don't even have to own your own home in any case for that. You can be renting an apartment, and that's still subject to reimbursement. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Somebody else says, if you reimburse yourself. For business use of the home, do you still have to depreciate the home? No, you, you're not depreciating it, but you're reimbursing yourself as though you are, and you don't have any recapture. And the section of it, uh, gosh, what is that? 280, like I, I could actually give you the publication, Robin, if you shoot me a... And, and that's uh, one of the big differences between the home office deduction and reimbursing for home office expenses. Mm -hmm. Is if you do the deduction, then yes, you do have to depreciate. Yeah, you can go 26, uh, Code of Federal Regulation, CFR, 1.62-2 is the section for reimbursement plans where it says you don't report it. So that's CFR 1-162-2. And any the actual any expenses, 26 USC 161, that allow any ordinary necessary business expense, right? So it's not right. 162. So those are your two sections. 280A is where you're going to find the ability to uh, to not have to report tax. It's G2 if you want a specific site. But otherwise, just shoot me an email and I'll point you to a bunch of other stuff. So uh, let's see which two do you recommend. I, I don't know what that's referring to. Uh, California can backtrack to have the S Corp. Can you backtrack to have the S Corp reimburse you? So um, can you go reimburse for something that the S-Corp, as an employee expense? So, so I'll, I actually can answer this one. So if you have an accountable plan, you're supposed to do them quarterly. If you go back, just know that if contested, you could potentially lose it. But I just don't see it being contested. If you right. incurred the expense and the company reimburses you, then 
frankly, I've seen people reimburse stuff that was incurred two and three years ago. You either document it as a loan to the company or as contribution, and it can always return that money to you at some point tax free. Right. Um, my husband and I, this is fun. This is a, Jeff's favorite one. <laughs> my husband and I file separately, but my husband didn't have any income in 2019, and I did. Can I claim him as a dependent on my return with the married filing separately status? And unfortunately, the answer is no, because if you're married, you can only claim yourself your own exemption. <laughs> um, nobody else can claim that exemption. Yeah. So if, if you want to claim the husband's exemption, you have to file married filing jointly. Mm -hmm. So you're going to have to file jointly if you're going to claim him as <coughs> dependent. Otherwise, he's his own, right? Right. Yeah. Head of household? No. No. If you're married, you can't claim head of household. Yeah. So divorce him or no, I'm just kidding. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, just kidding. Yeah. No. If you get divorced, then you can't. No. <laughs> Yeah. Um, and I know there's there's reasons that people file separately, but uh, just from a tax view, viewpoint, it normally doesn't work out better. Wow, somebody just asked another really <clears throat> good question. You guys, I'm getting killed with questions today. <laughs> ay, ay, ay. Um, can they re so somebody's saying, can a, can a business reimburse you for a percentage use of your house? Yes. Um, realistically, like you guys are starting to hit on these things. Whenever you're an employee of a company and the business gets a benefit from something of yours, it can reimburse you for the business use of that, or in some cases, 100% of it, regardless of how much is used for the business. So like on a cell phone, they don't care how much use is business. It could be 5%, but it can reimburse you the entire amount of your cell phone bill in your cell phone. Uh, same thing with equipment and same thing, uh, yeah, just period. Now, your house, when it reimburses you, it's reimbursing you for the right to use your home as an administrative office. It doesn't even have to be the principal place of business. It's right. where you do your administrative activities so long as you're not doing them elsewhere. So you could even have another office that you visit on a daily basis. And as long as you're not doing the P&L and the books and things like that in that office, just make sure you're doing it from home, company can still reimburse you. Now, most people... They have a business, like if there are a client where they probably have a ma management company, it's probably located out of state. There's a lot of reasons to do that, uh, not the least of which is complete anonymity, making something that's going to last a really long time, making it so nobody can take it from you. But one of the side benefits is you, you need a house. I mean, you need a home office and you need to have meetings like statutorily, like you're you're really creating a nice scenario for yourself to justify expenses and it can reimburse you under any reasonable methodology for calculating what that value is and you actually the irs gives you the schedule on reimbursing yourself for the depreciation on the house for the utilities even cleaners and it's going to be a percentage and some of the court cases they're going up 70 percent which blows me away because i'm always nervous when you get you know 25 30 percent mm -hmm. thing, and that's on the high end there was a case where it, they just got trashed and they got 42%. And it was because they're using their garage to store products. So I just look at it and say, hey, as long as you're creating a nice uh, situation, like you're actually doing the calculation, and I have a calculator that I give my clients. As long as you're doing the calculation you have, and you're justifying it, you're, you can literally have a company reimburse you for that portion of your house. We just did one where we did the calculation and the client receives $34,000 a year. And that's an actual portion of the expense. They, they live in the Bay Area, so it was a, uh, you know, it was an expensive house with lots of real estate taxes and all that fun stuff. It's not a small amount. And then you have some of the other houses where it's five and six thousand dollars a year. That's tax-free, buddy. So that's something that you should uh, never. So how do you determine what is a reasonable home office write-off? You do the test. You do the calculator. Uh, if you reimburse yourself business use, do you have to depreciate it? Uh, nope, we already answered that. Uh, you do not. You you reimburse yourself the portion of the reimbursement because the business is getting the benefit of using the home. Uh, how does the home office work with an LLC and reimbursement? Uh, even assuming that it's an S or a C corp, it literally just reimburses you out of its income. Um, and there's a whole bunch. Uh, 
when will you post your YouTube of today's webinar? Uh, Kim will probably be sending you guys a recording of it right after, so probably be tomorrow, and then we'll post it on YouTube. Usually it takes us a couple weeks to get it up to YouTube. I know we do a lot of them. Somebody says YouTube has 2019, 9 for 2020 date posted. So nine for 2020. Uh, yeah, that's weird. I have to figure that one out. Uh, or none for 2020 posted. We're, 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 we do so many, we have to post into the future. <laughs> <laughs> All right, we'll figure that out. All right, let's keep going on to these questions because uh, Jeff just keeps talking. I don't know why he just keeps doing this. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> let's go. <laughs> what determines your state residency when you live in a non-fixed location? So Jeff is going to go right around the country for the next five years in an RV. Me and my cats. You and your what kind of cat? I don't have a cat. <laughs> I have two uh, Persian cats. My favorite is Peaches and Clint. Um, all right, so <laughs> the they're cute. So some you, uh, I will show you pictures someday if anybody wants. All right. Um, if you live in a non-fixed location, so tell me where where do you reside? So, so the primary rule that the states look at is the 183 day rule, which means where did you spend most of your nights? Uh, if you're traveling between three or four locations and you have more than 183 nights in one state, that's what's going to be your residence is. Now. Since I like to move around a lot from state to state to state. Mm -hmm. You pass it around. Got to keep ahead of the feds. Um, <laughs> then, then I'm probably not going to have a joke about stuff like that. <laughs> These guys, uh, Jeff is a CPA. He's been a CPA for a really long time. How long? Uh, since 90. I've been practicing since like 91. 91. So a couple of years. I have people who work for me that aren't that old. Yeah. Um, no, so let's I'll say I'm going around in my RV. It, it's going to be, and I'm not staying 183 days in any particular state. Uh, they're going to look at, to where's my driver's license? Uh, what else, Toby? Oh, they're going to look at where you actually uh, vote, where you're, uh, sometimes they actually look and see, like if you're California, you're going to count how many lumens or whatever it is you're using. <laughs> Whatever your your bits of, uh, you know, of electricity, <laughs> you blast me. Uh, they're, they're adding everything up. They're looking yeah. at where your kids are going to school. They're looking at things that are normal. Like So for you in your RV, they're probably going to look and see where you're registered to vote, where your driver's license is at, where your insurance lists your address, things like that. That, that tag on your RV could be an indicator of where you are, what state you're in, because mm -hmm. that's usually supposed to be where that – vehicle is garaged now there's whole groups out there that do this stuff and i know mm -hmm. they're going to say like the dakotas texas florida are great states uh, because they don't tax you and they're pretty easy going so like but if you're not living there like if you're literally just showing up there for one day it's not going to work they're going to say uh if a state wanted to come get you like let's say you're in california a lot um they're pretty aggressive. They're going to say, where do you actually spend your time? And they're going to try to backtrack to figure out where it is that uh, you're ultimately located. Right. So that's always fun. Somebody else says, can a solo K be a joint venture partner to buy real estate? Um, the partner is the owner of the solar the solo K. That's awesome. So technically, yes. Uh but you got to be really careful. But you can partner with your own solo K. What you can't do is enter into transactions after. So you can't lift up a hammer. You can't benefit it in any way. Uh, the better route usually is to borrow money from your own K and then create a, you know, use it for your real estate and pay it interest and all that fun stuff. But technically, you can. You can actually, technically, there's something called a Rob's transaction, which is called rollover as a business startup. And you could use your qualified retirement account to start up a corporation that then runs a regular business. People do that all the time when they have a bunch of money in their retirement account and they want to buy a franchise or something. It's their second career. And they go um, do that. The only thing that I don't like about Rob's transactions is that about one in 13 are successful, according to the stats I've seen, which means I wouldn't drain your retirement account to go into business. Uh, it's just not going to be some, usually it's not, it doesn't end well. I have a revocable trust at year end does K one from my multifamily investment in my name and my social security number. 
or in the name of the trust in my social security number. Um, so Kim, I would make sure that it's going to your living trust just to make sure it's out of your estate. It's not going to matter from a tax standpoint though, at all. Uh, anyway, somebody else asks, how do you tax a basement rental in a primary home? So in other words, they have a basement that they're renting out. Mm -hmm. So they're going to break their house into two pieces. They're going to call one of it their personal residence, and then a portion of it they're going to call a rental. How do you protect yourself under those circumstances? I've, I've tried stuff, Meg. I've tried putting that in, like that portion of the home into an LLC. You can do that. You're going to have to use a trust to do it and then take just the beneficial interest, that small portion. I have never seen that tested. I've never seen somebody go to loggerheads on that. What you're really going to want to do is make sure that you have the right type of insurance and get yourself an umbrella policy because you're opening yourself up to a ton of liability by bringing people into your home. Just make sure, depending on the state, but you have a good homestead. If you don't have a good homestead, make sure there's a big loan against the house so someone doesn't get any bright ideas. It's usually a lawyer that gives them these bright ideas of attacking you for stupid stuff. Mm -hmm. And when you say basement, I immediately think mold, even though it may be a great basement. And that's just because you see so many cases. Somebody asked, when does the book come out? It's already gone to print, Sherry. The uh, print house that we use had had a, some sort of a equipment malfunction. And uh, it's supposed to be out uh, literally in the next few weeks. And we're going to send it out to everybody. I think we have electronic versions for everybody in the meantime. We fully expected to have it done and printed out by now. Uh, it's just we've run into the print problems and we're, uh, if anything, we're, we're too loyal, so we stick with companies, uh, but we'll get it out to you. All right, uh, next question. There it is. If I'm starting an LLC, what is the best entity to lend it money for startup? Just my personal opinion, you lend it the money yourself. Mm -hmm. uh, you don't start up another entity to lend money to your LLC. Just my opinion. Yeah. It doesn't really matter. Like, So if I have an LLC, and I'm going to loan it money. So this, is, this gets fun. I actually had this question yesterday from a dentist. So uh, here's what I would suggest. If you are going, like if you are lending it money personally, like you want to protect it, mm -hmm. uh, it gets interesting. Sometimes what's more fun to do is to go ahead and buy a CD, go to the same bank that where that LLC is banking and get a, line of credit using that LLC as a guarantee, as a security. Right. And what that does is it gives the LLC access to the line of credit. You still have your asset and it starts building up credit for that LLC so that eventually you don't need to keep that, that CD anymore. It takes about two years to do that. So I've actually done that transaction on a couple of different occasions for different startups. And it works like a charm because the bank's super happy. They always have an asset they charge you, they used to charge me 50 bucks a year for the line of credit, and then you only pay interest if you actually use it. Um, if you do that, you're still making some interest on your CD. The other route is you can just put it directly in to the company as a loan, right. buy a CD, have the line of credit there, and then pay yourself interest to get more interest out of it. You could do that too, and you could actually, you know. Yeah, that's a good idea. Work some money out, but it, it actually works really, really well because in – in the credit world, like whenever you say lending, it's cash collateral or credibility. It always comes down to those three things. Your credibility cannot be established without getting some credit. And here's an easy way to start a relationship with the bank. And they tend to like that. A um, couple more questions that came in online. There's a probably about 50 online right now. I know I have to get through them. What's the best way to send contributions for senior investors if they want monthly versus yearly? to send contributions for seniors. I, I'm not sure I follow that. I think you're saying what's the best way to return it, to pay them on a monthly or yearly basis. Uh, you can always return somebody's contribution to them tax-free and then anything above that would be taxable. You have the uh, K-1 that's gonna go out to them if I'm hearing that question. Uh, if a solo 1K puts up earnest money deposit on real estate purchase with an assignable contract as 1% what, does 100% of the assignment fee go back to the solo 401k? Must it go back? Uh, yeah, unless there's another party on that contract. If there's somebody else that you had to pay in the middle, then no, you'd, only, you'd have to put the net. 
Uh, can form 2553 convert the LLC back three years and 75 days? No. You can sometimes go back and do a late election. There's a revenue procedure that allows you to change an LLC to an S corp uh, for tax purposes. And it, I shouldn't say change the LLC to an S corp. It's change it from whatever it's, if it's a sole mm-hmm. proprietorship, if it's disregarded to an S corp, you can do that for the previous year up to where you file the tax return, so long as you follow the revenue procedure. Well, you can go back three years and 75 days. You can elect that far back, but the IRS doesn't have to approve it. Oh, so, and, so, so you can do a, a, a later election. And, can you and go back three years and Three days? years and 75 days. Oh, okay. So Jasmine, I strike, strike my no and change that to a yes, according to Jeff. You can go back three years and 75 days. And there's no guarantees. There's no guarantees you're going to get it. The rev procedure is almost a guarantee. It's not a guarantee. Right. But have you ever had one rejected? Uh, usually it's for a technical issue with the form or with the entity. Mm-hmm. So not, if you've Not just one. because they hate us. Yeah. Um, that's cool. So you can go back there. Somebody says that. So that's interesting. Wasn't a way you could go back that far. Learn something new every day. That's why I listen to Tax uh, Tuesday. Um, <laughs> all right, I'm just trying. To, let's keep going on. Somehow we got over an hour. Let's see. Tax liability. Oh, this is crazy. Tax liability is a dual citizen in Canada, USA. Recently received an inheritance from my Canadian parents. Mm. So the problem with being a dual citizen is you're subject to tax in dual countries. Mm-hmm. Um, so uh, we'll start off by answering the inheritance question first. Um, in the U S when you get an inheritance, there, there's no tax to you on that. Uh, I'm assuming it works similar in Canada. Mm-hmm. Canada treats when somebody passes, that's Canadian. <clears throat> they treat it as though everything was sold on the date of the passing. And so you get, you end up paying, of the capital gains, which is ordinary tax. So they treat it as though you've you've sold half the assets is what you end up paying tax on half the assets as though they were sold. So there's going to be a tax hit on the Canadian side. And then the rest of it depends on where you live. Now, as far as the dual tax, like between Canada and the USA, um, you really don't pay dual tax, uh, usually get some kind of credit for the tax paid to the other country. I think that Canada, like this is one of those situations where it could hose them. Yeah. Because you're going to, like, here's the thing. In the U.S., you have a huge exclusion. It's 11 million plus, 11.4 million per person. You're probably not going to have any USA tax. It does. If you're above that, then you probably could, and you'd have the Canadian tax. Because the USA taxes you based on your citizenship where Canada taxes you based on residence. So they're going to say, Hey, where the, where were the Canadian parents? Uh, we're going to tax that you're a citizen there. So then it comes down to where do you live? They're still going to tax it because the parents were there. And then the USA is going to tax you because you're a citizen of the U S even if you're a green card holder and you're a resident here, you're going to get taxed on worldwide. It's just, so this is something where you really do want to have, somebody take a look at it to make sure you're doing it right. I have some pretty good Canadian uh, accountants I can send you to, too. Um, There's some good folks up in Vancouver and then, uh, and they, they're they're pretty familiar. They're familiar with all the provinces. So they tend to be pretty good with the CRA. Uh, Moving on. God, we have a lot of questions that are still dreadly. And somebody actually write, can you write off your pet frog? David? No, I don't think so. Can you write off your pet frog? Only if it's a poison dart frog that you're using to make chemical remedies. For. <laughs> if it was a guard frog. No. Um, yeah. That's right. cool. Okay. <laughs> it's really vicious. All right. Um, clarification. I have a commercial building on an LLC disregarded, California disregarded LLC and want to assign it to a land trust and then assign the land trust to a new Wyoming LLC with partnership tax status. Can this be done and then cancel the existing California LLC? Um, not really. When you talk about assignment, you're not changing title. So it's, it's already in a California LLC. What you can always do is have that LLC held by a trust that's, that's assigned to a Wyoming LLC that you tax as a partnership. 
what that would do is end up making the the end party that's ultimately responsible for the tax is going to be that Wyoming LLC and it would pass it down to you. So that's the way you can do it. Um, I sold my rental property in 2019. Is there anything I can do now to avoid the capital gains that I'm going to have to pay or did I miss the boat on this one? Renee, you know, there's always something you can do. You can actually still do a cost seg on that, right? You can yeah. actually go up until you file your tax return. There's always something you can do. So we could take, and then you could also, if you have the capital gains, uh, you actually have some things you can do this year also to avoid those capital gains, or at least push them out another six years, which is the qualified opportunity zones. Um, somebody says our fully depreciated rental improvements subject to uh, unrecaptured gain on sale of the property. Uh, it's it's recapture. So it's, it's, it's basically depreciation recapture. And the answer is yes. Everything that you depreciated over those 27 and a half years is going to be recaptured at your ordinary bracket capped at 20, uh, 25% unless you do a 1031 exchange or pass away and, inher and somebody inherits it. Um, that's just mean, isn't it? It well, is. Look at this one. Is a self-directed IRA. So this is our uh, question here. I'm just going to do this. Is a self-directed IRA subject to UDFI when invested in a syndication that uses debt financing? If so, what's an alternative? Uh, the UDFI, <laughs> if it's being passed from the syndication to the self-directed IRA, they're going to have mm -hmm. to recognize it. Yeah. So on your K-1, it's going to say non-recourse financing or recourse financing. Right. You know, you know, unless your syndicator just doesn't. And I'll tell you right now, there's a lot of syndicators that don't, in which case you're supposed to report it. It's 990T. But most people, like, they don't ask for it and they don't push it and then they don't pay it. So if the IRS came in, you'd be in a little bit of hot water. Uh, but yes, it's still subject to UDFI. If you want to avoid it, the easiest way is to roll that into a 401k. 401ks are not subject to UDFI. And there, it goes away. See how easy that was? You cannot be an IRA with, with, with debt. You cannot use debt in an IRA without paying tax on it. You do not have to pay tax on debt in a 401k. Therefore, you have a very good reason to roll that self-directed IRA into a self-directed 401k to avoid that tax. Same type of issue here. UDIF, which is UDFI, with the IF backwards, right? I have no idea. All right. hey, it's supposed to be UDFI. Yeah. So uh, again, I grab these questions from people. And they always, sometimes we clean them up today, and really clean up too many. I'm going to shot them off. Will UBIT or UDFI occur in my self-directed IRA if I'm passively in syndications where there's a non-recourse loan? So it doesn't matter about the recourse, non-recourse. You cannot sign on to a loan. You cannot have a recourse loan, for example, in your own self-directed IRA. You just violated it, or 401k for that matter. If you have a non-recourse loan, then the self-directed IRA pays on the loan, uh, on the income produced by that phone. It's called unrelated debt finance income. It's debt finance income. Mm -hmm. So if it's making half the money is because of the debt, you pay tax on half the money. UBIT is another thing completely. It's unrelated business income tax. If you're passive, you don't have to worry about that. So if you're in an if you're in a syndication and it's and it runs active businesses like McDonald's and a bunch of other stuff, you don't have to care because your ownership's passive. You're not you you don't have UBIT. Right. If you ran a McDonald's in your self-directed IRA, you're going to have problems, and you're going to have UBIT because it's not going to let you have a leg up on the competition by not paying tax when it, you know for the exempt organization and that's whether you have a 401k or an ira both are going to be subject to ubit only iras are subject to udfi don't you love that stuff interesting stuff all right speaking of interesting actually there's a whole bunch of other questions if you have a meeting at home what's a reasonable reason reimbursement for home use you call around and get and get answers uh or get quotes that's the best thing uh if i sell inherited property in guatemala what are the tax liabilities in the u.s if i bring the proceeds back to the u.s for investment so you're going to have a mexican tax if you live here if you're a resident of the united states then you're going to have capital gains tax 
you're going to get a credit if there's taxes paid in Mexico or Guatemala. Guatemala. Yeah, so, excuse me, in Guatemala. I believe that we have a, uh, um, what's it called, uh, a treaty with Guatemala. I, I, you know, I, you know it's, it's something where I believe that you're going to get a credit for it, but you'd pay it in Guatemala and then you'd most likely get a credit subject to reviewing the treaty to make sure that it's, it's giving us that credit. When doing uh, the CFR 1-62-2 reimbursement, uh, do I need to have an accountable plan in place? Yes, so you still do it. It's accountable plan, and accountable plan's all of one page. Again, if you go through some of our classes, you're gonna see them all over the place. If you're platinum, you already have access to all those. If you're not platinum, then you should be. Uh, or you should go on to uh, TaxWise, because I give out the accountable plans at that too. Uh, all of those are really easy. And by the way, none of these things are like, you can go to the tax and AP event and get out, comp you in. It's not going to be a big deal. Um, somebody asked, um, and they left, so they I'm not going to answer a question that they left on. Uh, if you're recently divorced and choosing to live in the same house, can you claim the husband as the head of household as or head of household as your dependent? So this is going back to the married couple where the husband didn't make any money. If they get divorced and they live in the same house, now can the wife claim head of household? Uh, no, because, well, no, for a couple reasons. One, uh, he's not a qualifying dependent. Why not? They're not dependent. related. You're not related? So head he's not a qualifying household. child. He's not a qualifying relative. Oh, he's not nice. a dependent at all. If you take care for any adult that's not related, you can't, you can't qualify them no. as a dependent. It has to be related. Uh, the uh, the other yeah, issue a, is is how they're who actually owns the home, how they're dividing expenses and so forth. And well, that stinks. Hey, what is the best email address for more info on the home office reimbursement? Hey, uh, Patty or um, <clears throat> if Susan's still on. Maybe you guys can kick them. Uh, the, use the Tax Tuesday at Anderson, and then just make sure you're saying to, Toby asked for it, uh, or she'll, they'll give it to you. Does S Corp profit and loss on an 1120 flow directly to each of the two officers 1040? It actually goes to the uh, the shareholders, and yeah, it goes to their 1040 on page two of their schedule E. Uh, <laughs> you guys are stuck on this frog thing. You guys are mean. Um, let's keep going back in because we have a whole bunch of questions to answer, but I know we have a bunch that were already prepared. No, we didn't oh, that. go back to that one. That was a really cool one. I lost my property to foreclosure. I'm so sorry to hear that. My CPA treated it as an investment property since it was a rental property before I lived in it. However, I lived in that property for two years of the last five years. Was my CPA correct or should I amend that year tax return? Um, Jeff, let me just point one thing out before I hand this to you. If you made a mistake on your return and it was in all good faith and then you find out that you were wrong, you're not under a legal obligation to fix the return. That's number one. There's nothing that says you're supposed to go back in and read the tea leaves and go back. Oh, my gosh, I think I made a mistake. Now I have to amend because otherwise, holy credoli. What they care about is at the time you signed it, was it in good faith? Now, if you were wrong they could possibly go back and hit you with accuracy related penalties and stuff like that. But don't think that, that you're going to be like, Oh my goodness, I'm going to have to go back and do all this stuff. That's number one. So uh, this is really a facts and circumstance uh, issue uh, because there's a couple of calculations that go on here. One is how much COD income do you need to recognize? And that's cancellation of debt. Uh, meaning this was obviously a mortgage property uh, how much debt were you relieved of that exceeded the cost the, your, or the fair market value of your home? Mm -hmm. um, now, that COD income, uh, the five-year rule about excluding income never applies to COD income. It's always treated as ordinary income. So COD, there are some things on your personal property. And I think they just added more under the SECURE Act. I'm, I'm, I might be mistaken, but I believe they just extended retroactively COD income on your personal residence right. for a million or two million. And all that means is that if I loan Jeff a million dollars for him to buy a house and I secure it with the house and the house is worth a million when I do it and the house becomes worth 500,000, 
and I say, all right, Jeff, you don't have to pay me back the million. I'll take the house. House is worth half a million. I just canceled debt to Jeff for a million bucks. Mm -hmm. He doesn't have to pay me back. I'm going to say I got back half a million. And we used to have this issue when they would do the the 990 uh, or the uh, 1099 cancellation of debt, the the uh, the D or the A. So I uh, won't get into all that, but let's just say that there's half a million dollars that Jeff has relieved of. That's taxable to Jeff. Unless there's an exception and, and Congress created an exception because so many people are losing their houses to foreclosure. So there is that principal residence exclusion. Uh, unfortunately, it doesn't apply here because he was renting it out at the time. Well, here's the thing. He says that he lived in it, but it was two of the last five years. At the time he sold it, it could very easily have been an investment project. Okay, so since it, yeah, it was a rental property before he lived in it. So here's how it works. In order for me to take an investment property and make it into a residence, all I have to do is spend in one tax year more than 14 days there or – more than 10% of the days that it was actually occupied. Right. So then it's a residence, period. And I'm going to apportion Porto, you know, some of my depreciation, this, that, and the other. It's not going to be a principal residence. If I make it my principal residence, then I qualify for that two out of five year capital gain exclusion, it's just, it's section 121, on capital gains. But, but when you have capital losses, you can't write those off as an individual. But the property when it was sold was actually investment property. And you get into this weird thing because it was an investment property, then it was your primary residence, then it goes back to an investment property. You get into this weird thing where you have to calculate different times what it was worth. Correct. So we're calculating this, the COD income, cancellation of debt income. We're calculating how much recapture there might be because you depreciate this property as a rental. And you're capturing how much loss you receive because when you dispose of business property, I think it's 165, right? Right. And I think that's the one that catches people by surprise. They think there's just that COD income. Yep. Well, you could also have additional loss, loss or gain based on just giving yep. up the house. Mm -hmm. Somebody just said, uh, this is funny. Yeah, this is 401k. Did you just say you can't pick up a hammer? In a four, solo 401k. Yes, if you have a piece of property, you can't use your personal labor to improve it or you disqualify that property. In an IRA, you disqualify the whole IRA. In a 401k, you disqualify that portion uh, of an asset. Um, what if you have both an S and a C corp? Can you get reimbursed for the office for both? A portion of the office. If you have two offices, then yes, you could do it. If you have a uh, office that's used for both, then you can apportion half to half. Yeah, you, you yeah. can't you can't, can't double, double your, your expense. You cannot double that. All right, let's keep going. We have a somehow we got over. Uh, Is it past four already? Because you talk so much. I know. I'm sorry. <laughs> all right, it's all me. I I own it. I'm a chatty Kathy. All right. So my question today is, if I have a Roth IRA, do I pay capital gains tax on the monies that the IRA, that the Roth produces, or is that growth tax deferred? That's how we spell deferred in Kentucky. Deferred. <laughs> uh, growth deferred. Yeah, every everything in that Roth IRA after you're, uh, you've held it for five years is going to be um, taxed. Not tax deferred. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be taxed, period. Yep. You don't have to pay tax on it as long as you meet the five year rule, like the five, you know, the, the, the three fives, the trio of five. The years. trio of fives. Wait five years, then you can do whatever. Uh, I have transitioned to real estate professional this year, looking on how to write off expenses on my husband's W 2 income. So if you are a real estate professional and you meet the test under 469C7, which is that two part test. Uh, which is the 750 hours, half your time, plus material participation in your rental real estate, then your real estate losses that would ordinarily be considered passive become non-passive. And you literally just check a box on your uh, return on your Schedule E that says it's non-passive. And then that will offset your W-2 income, your spouse's W-2 income, assuming you're filing jointly. Yeah, also real estate professional does is it allows you to take your rental loss, your passive losses mm -hmm. and, and, and real estate. 
Um, so you're not really writing expenses off against the husband's W-2. You'll have the husband's W-2 on one line. On another line will be these big losses from all your rental losses. Uh, and that's how that works. Mm-hmm. So you just nailed it. So this, this person's actually ahead of the game. So all it means is that if you have active ordinary income, and you have rental losses, and the rental losses doesn't mean you actually lost money. It means you could de- rapidly depreciate a section of the building or of the rentals, and it creates a paper loss. It's just going to offset your W-2 income at the highest bracket. So it actually is usually pretty tasty when you do that. I have a family limited partnership that is going to get a large sum of money. I plan to put it all into a nonprofit. Any taxes out? I'm assuming that this large sum of money is going to be some kind of income, mm-hmm. um, which is great. But if this is your only source of income mm-hmm. um, and you put it all in the nonprofit, you're only going to get to deduct 60 percent of that. Uh, there's the 60 percent rule for adjusted co- gross income. of adjusted gross income that. Yeah. Uh, so all this is going to go through your tax return as income, and then you're going to take a itemized deduction of up to 60% of your AGI. So let's say you have a family limited partnership, and it's going to get a large sum of money. I, I have no idea. You know, you, you know the prints. You got it on an email, and it says you're going to be. Mm-hmm. I always think that's what's going on. But let's just say you have. Let's say you have capital gains, and it's gone up, and you're going to sell, and you're going to have all this money. You're going to distribute it out to the partners, and you say, you know what? I don't want to pay tax on that you could actually give your partnership interest to the nonprofit and you would avoid all tax on that. Now it could sell and the taxable event occurs. Now it flows into the nonprofit that would avoid all taxes. Right. If, uh, if it exceeds 60% of my adjusted gross income. And in that particular case, it's a capital asset. It's going to be capped at 30% of your adjusted gross income, assuming you held it for more than a year. You just carry that forward for five years. Right. You're gonna, like it, it's going to be able to use, offset for the next five years. So there's 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 two things going on here. It's hey, it hasn't made the money yet. Should I give it to the nonprofit now at a lower valuation? Maybe if you think you're going to have a big hit. And before you guys think this stuff's all crazy, there's PayPal was partially funded through a Roth IRA. You know, so like they made millions and millions of dollars in a tax deferred account. The rules of the IRAs and 401ks, it's the same for a nonprofit. It's still an exempt entity. So you could take that and put it in anywhere. Um, well, and, and also in your example, I mean, I could sell a property in my family partnership for, say, half a million. Uh-huh. But my gain may only be a small portion of that. So uh-huh. uh, I may be contributing. So that's when you, what you're talking about of just mm-hmm. contributing the LLC and yeah, put the limited partnership unit here. Yeah, the limited partnership. Yeah, so it goes like this: if I have stock that's worth a thousand dollars and my basis is a hundred bucks, so I'm going to have nine hundred dollars a gain. I could sell it, pay tax on the nine hundred a gain, and then give all that money to charity. So I'm going to have a taxable event on nine hundred dollars, assuming it's long-term capital gains. It could be taxed as low as zero and as high as twenty-three point eight percent. So I give that money away and I'm going to get to write off that asset because I gave cash. I'm going to get to write off against 60 percent of my adjusted gross income. So assuming that's all the money I have, I'm only going to get a partial deduction this year and I'm going to carry it forward next year. Or I could just give the entire thousand dollars of stock away and have it sell it. I get a thousand dollar deduction and zero income. I have zero income. So I just carry that forward, but I don't have any tax hit. So it's kind of nice. This is the little slide. I don't need to do that because I'm not answering questions. Here's AndersonAdvisors.com podcast. You can go in here. You guys can listen to it. I know there's a bunch of questions. I'm going to knock them out in the last few minutes before we, we go. But just know you can always listen to these on the podcast. iTunes, it's free. Google Play, it's free. You can follow us on social media. Let's go through some of these questions. Uh, a few of you guys asked really long questions. I'm not going to ask the, answer the really long questions. I'm going to answer the short ones. Can a holistic medicine be deducted in a C-Corp? Holistic medicine, if it's, if it's, if it's for if the it's medication. If it's by a medical care, practitioner, yeah. yeah. Or if a doctor tells you that you need it, yes. If it's things like when you say holistic medicine, if you're using like 
uh, vitamins and things like that? The answer is no, unless it's prescribed for a specific illness. Uh, to fully fund my family and trust, does that mean changing the beneficiary of my employee pension plan as well? Uh, Kevin, you want to make it a contingent beneficiary. And yes, yes. you just make it a, it, it's not your primary beneficiary necessarily, like maybe make that a spouse. Uh, but uh, otherwise, uh, you would just make it a contingent. It would be the secondary. Uh, when will I get an electronic copy of the book? If you bought the book, they should give you the electronic copy. So I'll make sure, Patty, make sure she gets it. I rent a portion of my house as a vacation rental. Can I still claim this? Uh, can I claim the same house as my personal residence? Yes, but you're going to have a portion that if you exceed 14 days on, and this is what's weird, the VRBO is about whether it's taxable. So we know that you're using VRBO. If you go above 14 days on that room or that portion of the house, then you're, you just treat that portion of the house as investment property. So it does, it, it makes your house into two pieces. One right. of it's investment property and the other portion is, uh, uh, the other portion's primary residence. Somebody wrote me a, a book here. Thank you, Turin. But you're going to have to email that in. I'm not, that's just literally, it's a paragraph. Um, which type of HELOC should be used as a second lien to pay off your mortgage much quicker? Is there a strategy that you're knowledgeable about? Which type of HELOC should be used as a second lien? I don't know. Um, a HELOC is a home equity line of credit. I don't know what type you're thinking of. Can the CD as collateral for the line of credit to the LLC be used as an asset protection as well? Yes, absolutely. Depending on whether you're keeping it in there or outside. Uh, what if the LLC is an undesignate is, is undesignated and you open up a checking account? How is the LLC defined for tax records? Uh, records? LLCs by default are going to be ignored for tax purposes to their owner. Uh, if you have more than one owner, that by default they're a partnership. So hope that helps. Uh, for the line of credit, we should have a contract with the LLC. Uh, yes, yes, absolutely. You would actually have a loan or you're contributing that money. In either way, you're documenting it. What is a solo K? That's a 401k. With one member. Yeah, with, with one member. A husband and wife count as one member or a, a partner counts as a member. What are the implications of a C-Corp with an accountable plan that reimburses 2019 expenses in 2020? So you're reimbursing things from last year. It can't write it off until it pays you back. Correct. Um, five, seven, 15 year property does not need to be recaptured if the life of the property has passed and the improvement has been fully depreciated. What about 27 and a half year property? Correct, Ross. You don't have to recapture, it's all capital gains if you exceed the 15 years. Like, so let's say you had 15 year property, five, seven, and 15 year property, you held the house for 15 years, then you sold it 15 years in. All that five, seven, and 15 year property has no value. It's all going to be treated as long term capital gains. The 15 years of depreciation under the 27 and a half years is going to be recaptured. So a portion of that is the structure. So you're going to have a little bit of re recapture, not much, and it's way better. So sometimes we do cost segs before we sell a building for that precise reason. We've actually have a great example of about $80,000 of savings on a $3 million sale. Um, does the rental income from a trust need to be reported on Schedule E or can it be reported directly on Schedule one, uh, Line 1 of the 1040? So if it's a 1041, it's going on. It's going on Schedule E, page 2. Yep, going on E. I live in Nevada. Can you write a, or New York, can I write off a red light ticket? No. No. Fines no. and penalties are never deductible. Yeah, you're toast. Um I had withdrawn about, uh, withdrew about $78,000 from my IRA last year. I know I have to pay tax plus penalty. I have W-2 and I am thinking, is there any way to save tax on the mess? Uh, yes, I would actually uh, give us a call on that one. Like give us, uh, email us so we can actually have you talk to somebody to see if there's a way we can either undo it or minimize the tax hit. Yeah, there's some penalty exemptions. Uh, there's too many to list right now, but. There are exemptions and it's just a matter of writing the letters. And so you're gonna wanna bait me. You're not gonna wanna write those letters yourself though. Just never deal with the IRS on your own. Um, if my self-directed 401k passively invests 
in my self-directed 401k, okay, this is, this is two sentences that mean the same thing. If my self-directed 401k invests in a real estate syndication that is doing ground up development, will I be subject to you bit? Um, no, you're never going to be because the syndication, you're, you're passive. Uh, Somebody says, just, do I write off my cat as my partner? Only if he has a frog. <laughs> You're mean. And yes, I do have a cat named Clint. And no, I didn't name it Clint did because he has a cat named Toby. And he thought everybody <laughs> made fun of him. Um, yeah, so somebody was asking about real estate professional. It's 469C7. Um, and I'm there's you, you'd find this all over the place. Uh, in in previous Tax Tuesdays. They're all over the place, the real estate professional, plus on our website. Um, can I include my HSA out-of-pocket expense in the C corporations? The HSA would be a deductible expense. But if you have a non-reimbursed expense, could you reimburse it out of a C corporation? Yes. So I think yes, but your HSA is not going to be able to go through there. No nope. question on a Roth IRA five year rule for multiple conversions. If Roth account opened 2017, made first conversion on 2018 and second on 2019, does each conversion have its own five year clock? That yes. is correct. Yes. Now, when you're just talking about Roth contributions, uh, once that clock starts, it runs for every contribution after that, but not the conversions. Mm -hmm. Uh, so it says if the, see, there's, I have some cat lovers out there. If you guys saw my cats, you would die. They're absolutely cute. So we'll have, we'll have a cat show one day. We'll actually say <laughs> you guys can send in your cats and we'll have a special tax Tuesday for cats. I don't care if everybody's a dog person. I've, I've had dogs too. Cats are cool. Uh, is the, if the loan is non-recourse debt and, and you lost the property to foreclosures, the 1099 C COD income non-taxable. No, so if you had a loan and you no longer had to have to pay it, oh, wait a second. So it's non-recourse debt. So if it's not theirs, it's just the property, then would they have COD yes. income on the property maybe? On the property. But if it's they, they can't go beyond. But it's non-recourse, right? They can't go after them for it. Oh, no. The recourse debt was with... So they, I mean the non-recourse debt. So it sounds like they gave it. It was an asset loan. They foreclosed on the property, and somebody still gave them a, a 1099 COD. So they could go after them up to the amount of their security. Up to the amount of the security. That's it. So, um, and would it be non-taxable? No, it it's going to still be taxable to you up to probably the amount of the security. Is that what you're thinking? Well, the only place I've ever, Actually, no, I don't, I don't ever the only place I've ever seen where it makes a difference between non-recourse and recourse is with recourse debt, after they take your house, they can keep going after you. Mm -hmm. Whereas non-recourse, they, they can't. That's their hands right. are tied. Right, so you're still a guarantor. So I'm just thinking of this differently. Um, so yes, uh, it depends on whether it's a personal residence or uh, a business property was business property. You get the loan, you get the loss on the property against that income too. Mm -hmm. What are the advantages and disadvantages of making a donation to a donor advised fund through a provider? Uh, I know the Daffy as well, Eston. So uh, the advantages are you get the tax deduction now, and then you can allocate those funds over a period of years. The other downside is they don't have to give it to the fund, to the charity that you designate. And some of the funds have uh, religious restrictions or restrictions on certain activities, like they won't give it to a religious organization. So some of the funds won't let you give it to your church, for example. So you would just check with the provider, but just know that that provider could change their mind. Um, not that I've ever seen one do it, just know that legally they could. Um, if I purchase a single family home and rent it out until I can afford to buy it, is it better to buy it under an LLC set up as a lease option? So it sounds like, um, you buy it and then you rent it to somebody and you want them to buy it in the future, then a lease option is your best bet. So buy it under an LLC, yes, and then do a lease option for, for some for folks. There's some states that don't allow it, like Texas. They have a little bit of a weird rule on lease options, so just make, make sure that you can do it. 
can we claim American Home Shield monthly fees for rental property? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, that sounds like a reasonable expense. Um, and uh, ordered a few copies, would like to receive some. So, okay, Patty, just make sure that Steve and some of these guys get electronic copies of the book. Uh, Real Estate Professional, we already did that. All right, so we've gone way over and uh, apologize for doing that. I think we got through most of the questions. There's a lot of questions out there. Some of the, if they were big, then we're going to tag you. And um, see, here somebody says something cool. They saw my cat three days good. I enjoyed your uh, microchip computer pens. Great rest of your week. And yes, your cat is lionly cute. See, so there's somebody. So you get a star, Johnny. Um, everybody knows my kitty. Can a COD from margin call be used to offset the capital loss? Can COD cost margin call sell like options be used to offset the capital loss on Schedule D? Uh, COD. Uh, I, I've fun. never seen a margin call where it exceeded the amount of the securities. Yep. Yeah, so that's kind of weird. Maria, we'd have to see uh, a little bit more on that. Uh, and then, yeah, if, if anybody has purchased the new tax-wise, it's been done for a couple months, but it's been languishing in the printer. Uh, their printing press broke, but it's Bookmasters, their big one, and they always get us their books. So they should be here anytime, hopefully, sooner than later. Um, and we'll get you the physical book. Hey, if you guys want to see the replay, go to the podcast, or if you're a platinum member, it'll be in your platinum portal. And then, uh, by all means, shoot in your questions to tax Tuesday at AndersonAdvisors.com or visit us at Anderson Advisors. Those of you sending your tax Tuesday questions, it goes through and they're, they're, if, if it's very specific, they're dulling them off to folks. If it's general, and we get hundreds of them, by the way, guys, we take them and then we make them into these uh, Tax Tuesdays. So um, you can see a few people are looking for the uh, the book, so I'll, 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 I'll get it. Uh, I sent question in email hours ago, resent during the webinar. I'm not seeing them, Carol. They're all going through the Tax Tuesday group. So if you sent it just before, understand we get about, again, there's hundreds of questions. They're going through them. We're not getting them right before. If, if you're going to have a question that's going to go on a tax Tuesday, it was probably sent in two or three weeks ago. Um, if you want something like, like to get answered right away, uh, ask it during the live event or send it with an urgent request, and they'll make sure that they get it. We'll, we'll go look for it and make sure that we're getting your response, Carol. So um, that is it. Thanks, guys, for joining us, and I hope you enjoyed it. We always do. Jeff. Right. Thanks for spending an hour with us. Yeah, <laughs> that long hour. We'll see you next time.